and I used to be able to throw real frisbees, <laughs> but somebody clipped my wings and they won't let me do it anymore, but you know, so I got these fake frisbees that I have to throw. Yeah. So anybody want one? Fine disc, fine disc, fine disc, fine disc, fine disc, fine disc, usually fine disc, that was for you. Man, you got to teach those Frenchmen how to catch. Fine disc, fine disc, fine disc. All right, so cheap, cheap. All right, that's enough out of you. All right. Okay, so this is toward an attribute-based, role-based access control system. I gave a lightning talk on this at ApacheCon, and they they were joking. They were talking about roles like they're that roles to eat. And no, it's not that kind of role. It's wonderful to be in Sofia for LDAPCon. It's always great to be here. It's a great honor. That's me, that monkey dude. And I'm a software architect. And I work with the Apache Directory Project with my colleague Emmanuel and Karen in the back. Moonlight with Open LDAP ride my bike mostly. So we're going to talk about some access control methodology, specifically role-based access control and how it can be improved with attributes. What is role-based access control? We've talked about it here many times. We're talking about a specification by American National Standards Institute, ANSI, specifically Insights 359. Them cats right there were the, really the main dudes, Dr. Kuhn, David Ferraiolo, and Robbie Sandu, very influential gentleman from NIST. So what is role-based access control and what relationship does it have to the Starship Enterprise? I mean, don't those guys look about the same, but, and are they still using role-based access control on that enterprise? We don't know. <clears throat> Haven't we been here before? Indeed we have. We've talked about RBAC many times. <laughs> Every time it's new? Yeah. yeah? You're too kind. Indeed we have. Uh, my first LDAP con was 2011. We listened to Peter and uh, Marcus tell us the pros and cons of using LDAP as a back end for an RBAC system. I got on stage and introduced Fortress, which is a project that I started that was um, donated to Open LDAP at that time. And again, in Paris, we talked about it. That time I got on stage with Peter and Marcus as we uh, proposed a standard LDAP schema for RBAC which was a good idea then, I still think it's a good idea. Indeed, RBAC wants to be in LDAP, it just has an affinity for it. That's why we talk about it. It just fits quite nicely. And then LDAP sort of has an affinity for RBAC. I mean, a lot of LDAP implementations, they want to they have a role-based access control system in there. So that's why we talk about it, that's why it's relevant. But at that one, um, my colleague Matthew, introduced the RBAC Accelerator, which is a, um, an open LDAP overlay policy decision point that runs inside of open LDAP, kind of a cool thing. And then I continued on with that concept in 2015 at Edinburgh. And we actually took a break and didn't talk about it in 2017, surprisingly. And here we are again. So for the benefit of those who aren't as familiar with the concepts, Role-based access control is based on a practice that's been happening for decades, indeed in the 80s. It was going on and then that practice was 
turned into a model and formalized in the 90s by the NIST team. We already mentioned uh, David Ferrai Olo and Richard Kuhn. And, uh, you know, the idea was to improve access control, to make it better, to standardize it. And eight years later, in 2000, Ravi Sandhu joined the team. And they fur further formalized the model and crystallized into a set of functional specifications that we'll kind of look at here in a minute. And that formed the basis for Insights 359, which is called the core. And then there's some companion specs, one of which is 494, which adds attributes, which is kind of the point of this talk. So that is the canonical RBAC model. You have roles. Roles is a many-to-many -many mapping between users and permissions. Permissions is a mapping between objects and operations. So customer account read, that's a permission. Gets assigned to a role, gets assigned to a user. The session is really a key concept of RBAC. Just because that role was assigned to the user does not mean that it's going to be considered in the access control decision. That's a very important facet of, the, of this model. And then we have these higher forms of, so all of that is part of the base. In order to be deemed compliant with RBAC, you have to be able to do these things right here. And then there's these higher sort of optional features, RBAC ones, hierarchical roles, that's inheritance relationships between roles, which is used for the role engineering process. RBAC two, static separation of duties, exclusion constraints between assigned roles just because, uh, well, so if you have two roles that maybe if you gave it to a single user would give them too much power, say check approver, check writer, and you want to avoid a conflict of interest, you can, you can prevent that at the access control administration time with static separation duties. And, and three is dynamic separation of duties, which is exclusion constraints between activated roles. So maybe you can be assigned this set of toxic roles, but you can't activate them in the session at runtime. So we talked about the object model. It's very elegant. Um, very concise, easy to understand. The functional model is the same way. The specifications outline the functions very explicitly. You have a set of administration functions, which is how, the administra how you put the policy into the back end. So adding, updating, deleting roles, permissions, users, it's all part of that. You have um, another set of functions for policy inter interrogation, the review functions which is, um, you know, for auditing or um, compliance to determine who has access to what, who has access to this resource, what roles does Bob have, whatever. Those APIs are part of the standard. And then you have the system APIs, which are the ones we usually think about, and those are used at runtime, which are here. And so the demos that I'm going to be showing you are using these APIs. Create session is what happens in the very beginning. You authenticate the user by whatever means. It doesn't matter. With RBAC, it doesn't care how you authenticate. And then there's that role activation that we're talking about, where one or more of the assigned roles are then activated into the session. You have session permissions, which is to give me all of the permissions that, are, that, are, that correspond with those activated roles, presumably because there is a a need to cache those. You have check access, which is to say, can I do that one thing? You, and then you can add and remove roles in the session. We're going to kind of take a look at that in just a moment. So Apache Fortress, and I talked about Fortress, so I introduced Fortress here in 2011, and we donated it to the OpenLDAP project, and then in 2014, Emmanuel Charney and I and some others moved it into the uh, Apache Software Foundation as a subproject of Apache Directory. So Apache Fortress is a fully compliant role-based access control system. It does the RBAC 0 through 3 using an LDAP as the back end. 
And so out of the box, it works with Open LDAP or Apache directory, but it is indeed LDAP compliant, LDAP v3 compliant. So it would work with any LDAP directory, even Active Directory. Yeah, seriously. Uh, there's a few components that um, go with it. The core is the APIs, it's a Java-based project. And then for um, other platforms, say, whatever, there's a web API in Fortress REST, RESTful system. And then it has a web component called Fortress Web that's, um, you know, gives you HTML pages for policy administration and review. That project is here. It's under the Apache license, fully open. We have a community that's fairly active, and we welcome anybody to come join us and, and have fun with us. Okay, so it's time for the first demo. Uh, I want to show you the Apache Fortress demo. This is a demo that I give a lot. It's really more for end-to-end um, -end security, web application security. Uh, it's a um, web, Java web app, and it uses, again, an LDAP as a back end, and it has a database where there's data, so it's the idea is to show you how to do security. And it uses Apache Fortress for the policy enforcement, a role-based access control system. And we have a very simple policy in there, and there's some customer data. Uh, three pages, page one, page two, page three. Three sets of customer data for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, obviously contrived. And we want to control, the, the, the requirements are, we want to control which um, page a user can hit on behalf of a particular customer. And so we've created nine roles for that. And then we have a dynamic separation of duty constraint placed upon those roles to say one and only one of those roles may be active in the session at a particular point in time. So there are um, some use cases with these users. Have say user one, two, three, that can hit all pages for one customer. User one can hit a single page for, um, user one can hit all, a single page for all customers. User one, one, two, three can hit a single page for a single customer or whatever. You can slice and dice that in any way you want, but this is really just to kind of introduce how the RBAC system behaves So I have for you one of my typical ugly user interfaces in uh, army green that this was really at Matt Harden's request because he really loves that color. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> so I'm gonna log in as user123, one, user one, which has access to all pages for a single customer. So let me enter that in. Get to the landing page, and you can see the, um, the application understands the policy. It's presented me with links to all three pages. I can click on a page. I have um, these entry fields and whatnot, but there's no buttons down here because the user has not activated a role yet. So this is a contrived example. This wouldn't be the way a normal app would be behave, but it shows you kind of how this mechanism works. So in order to be able to uh, change any of that data, I have to activate a role. So I'm gonna activate the one for page one, one, two, three, because I'm on page one. So that'll give me access to um, customer one, two, three's data on that page. So now the buttons pop up, and now I can interrogate the database on behalf of that customer and add, update, delete data, so on and so forth. So if I wanted to then access a different customer, say four, five, six, <coughs> the policy enforcement engine won't let me do that because I haven't activated that role in the session yet. So in order to, so let's activate that role. So I'm going to go to the drop down and I'm going to activate page two, one, or actually for this one, I have to go to page two. So I'm going to activate page two, one, two, three. and I get a failure because the policy enforcement engine understands that there's a dynamic separation duty constraint. I can only activate one of those in the session at a time. That kind of gives you an idea how it works. So, you know, if I 
logged on as say user one, one, two, three. Again, the, the application understands the policy only presents me a link to one page. I click on that. Again, I would have to activate that role. You get the idea, right? So any questions of kind of about how that works? Pretty straightforward. Okay, lovely. Got through the demo, everything works fine. We're all convinced RBAC's the way to go. That, demo, that particular application's in my public GitHub account if you want to try it out and wow your friends. Be my guest. But we got a problem. We got a big problem. Anybody know what it is? Sorry? Rut row. Anybody? Karen. I'd give you a frisbee if I had one. But I don't. Roll explosion. Our rolls are exploding. What do we mean by that? So as soon as you add context to the decision, you have role explosion. What does that mean? So defined formally, the number of roles that you need is the number of roles times the number of relationships. This is not a new problem. You know, some people say, ah, role explosion is new. It's been around, the, the folks who drafted the specification were aware of this problem when they drafted it. That doesn't mean it's not a problem. It's just not anything that was unknown. So in the example I just showed you, we had three roles, three customers. So in order to do fine-grained authorization based on the context, you end up with nine roles. Ah, that's fine with three customers. What if you have 1,000 customers? What then? What if you're on Ludo's team and you have a million customers? Are you going to have three million roles? I don't think so. So what do we do? We just give up, say RBAC doesn't work, try something new, let's do ABAC. Attribute-based access control, yeah. Everything's an attribute. Role's an attribute, the context's an attribute, it all gets assigned to the customer, policies are dynamic, it's wonderful. So, and ABAC's not new, that concept's been around for decades as well. We used to call it dynamic authorization. We've been trying to get this right for ever since I've been in this business. And there are some, despite its complexity, there are a couple attempts to standardize it. Extensible access control markup language, XACML is one of them, which is a uh, standard governed by OASIS. <coughs> NIST threw their hat in the game and there's this next generation access control standard, ANSI 4499, that I don't think has any traction at all, but it's out there. Uh, the complexity makes it difficult to implement, which means there's not going to be a lot of options. You're going to have proprietary solutions, which may be okay if you're a large organization, but what if you're a smaller organization or a smaller government? Are you going to be able to pay somebody to help you implement that. So there are, there is, um, and I've done some Googling, trying to look for open source implementations of ABAC. OW2 has one. Does anybody use that? Off Z Force? Heard of it? One. It's based on the OASIS Xacamal uh, standard. And in, in Xacamal, everything's a, a, an XML request. Okay. Between all the intermediaries, you, you format your request in XML and send it. So as I said, uh, ABAC implementations are, are costly. They're, they're hard to implement. You have to collect uh, the attributes and concentrate them. You don't have that elegant data model anymore. So that makes it quite hard to um, keep track of. And you have to introduce, you know, different uh, services that, that um, support it. And so 
As a re result, you have some performance issues. You know, XML between intermediaries is certainly not going to be as efficient as LDAP v3. Try as it might. Complexity is a, is a problem. And as I've already said, traction. There's not a lot of traction in these standards. So, you know, this is the NIST publication of what an enterprise APAC implement implementation would look like. I mean, I think I'll just retire before I do that. So what do we do? Do I just retire and give up, say, or can we have another look? Is there, is there something that we can do? Can our back be saved? And the answer is yes, or I wouldn't be here. Um, I already mentioned uh, Insights 494, policy enhanced RBAC, introducing uh, attribute modifiers into the, the decision. Remember we talked about that role activation phase in the beginning. That's an opportunity to introduce attributes, to inter introduce context into the access control decision so that you can do it during the role activation phase. There's also another opportunity bet between the to do that in the role permission activation phase. So for example, in the role activation, we can say, hey, this user can only activate that role at a particular store or role permission. That action can only be performed on a particular account, things like that. So again, I mentioned the user role activation. Apache Fortress, which is my project, has had constraints on role activation since the very beginning, uh, specifically temporal constraints to say you can only activate that role at a particular time, at a particular date, on a particular day. And so we're talking about introducing a new kind of constraint in that same phase, a dynamic constraint. So you can do something like this where you have, you know, a role assignment, say you're a teller, and you can only activate it in the north. So the context would be location. You can only activate it on the north branch. So what's that do to our elegant model that we started out with? We've added a couple bubbles to it. And factoring in the rest, we're still we're still okay. I think it's still fairly, fairly tight. So what does that mean? We now have R back and A back together. It means we can introduce arbitrary attributes into the role activation phase. It also means the role becomes special. The access control engine understands that it can only activate that role when the conditions are correct. So the advantage is we fix the role exp explosion problem. We can continue to use our RBAC systems, and it's simpler to implement and maintain, and we have virtually no limit on the types of attributes that we can introduce. So a simple example, back to our uh, financial institution, we've got a bank branch, we've got a couple roles that we want to introduce, we've got the teller, and we've got a, a coin washer very important function in, in the financial institution. And we want to constrain it by location. So we want to do something like this and say, yeah, Curly, he's a coin washer in the north and the south, and he's a teller in the east, and Moe's a coin washer in the east and the south, and he's a teller in the north, and so on and so forth. But we don't want to do this, because what if our bank had a thousand branches, right? We don't want to explode. We want to stop doing that. So again, that role becomes special. We have to constrain it by a piece of context. So we have to tell the access control engine, hey, you know, when you see coin washer, you better evaluate that context for location before you activate it. When you see teller, you better do the same. We only have two roles. We could have a, a million branches, <coughs> and then we constrain it by the attribute. It also means we have to store that context on the role assignment itself. So on the user entry, perhaps, you would add that contextual information to the user. No magic here. So how's that look under the hood? Here's a screenshot of um, an, a user in the Apache Fortress 
system. That's a, an LDAP backend. And so we are storing attributes on that user that are corresponding with the user role assignment. And then we add those little bits of context in there to say here, you know, Curly is a washer in the south and a washer in the north, and he's a teller in the east. Any questions about this? Pretty straightforward. Very simple, very simple change to the system. It was when, I, when we came up with the idea, and Marianne, you were in the room, right? Remember when we were at PwC? And we're like, wow, this is easy. Why didn't we do this? So the code is also pretty straightforward. Here's some Java code for instantiating a session with Apache Fortress. And uh, so, you know, you obviously have to have a user. And now we have this new entity called role constraint that we instantiate. And we have to set the, the key and the value. So location north. And then that constraint then gets added. Remember the create session API along with the user. Okay, and then the access control engine can then grind on that and figure out what needs to happen. So, uh, um, okay, so just real quick. So here would be, um, you know, here's a test. Just a simple um, JUnit test that's in the Fortress code base where we're grinding on these users. And you can see here we've got um, Mo, and he is in the, nor uh, the north. And so, you know, we talked about the roles that are activated in the session. So in this case, his um, role that he's activating, the bank user is a base role. But the, the actual role is teller, so he's going to be a teller in the north. And then remember the session permission API I, I talked about in the beginning. When you delineate all the permissions that are active, then you see this, and those are the permissions for, um, for Mo in that particular session, and those are the permissions for doing um, teller activities. So seeing that in a visual um, perspective, and I, I took Matt's advice and I got rid of the ugly green and so now I gave a lovely blue. So um, when I log in as say Curly into this app, we can see that you know at his landing page he doesn't have anything because he because we're we haven't activated a constraint yet. So if we activate a constraint you know, because he's, he's had teller and coin washer assigned, but they're not active because it hasn't, um, because the constraints don't match. So if we activate a constraint, I did south, well, he's a washer in the south, and so the link for the washer pops up, and now he can soak the currency and rinse it and dry it and keep the money nice and clean for the folks down south. Or if he's, you know, in the east, Perhaps he's something else. In this case, yes, he's a teller, right, in the east. So he can, when he goes to the east branch, he can do the teller things and give people their clean money. Or if he's in, the, say, the, the west, when Curly goes to the west branch and signs in, he can't do anything because he doesn't have the proper constraints for that. So that example I just showed you with the lovely blue page is called the RBAC ABAC sample. That's an Apache Wicked app that's in my public GitHub account. You can try that out if you want. It runs inside Tomcat and uses Apache Fortress as the policy enforcement engine. So back to the original example where we had these um, customers and pages. And um, so what would happen if we applied ABAC to that same, um, that same sort of use case? How would it work? So um, let's try it. So let's log in, say in this case, as user 456, which has access to all pages for customer 456. So this is combining RBAC and ABAC together. 
The landing page looks exactly the same. You have you know, the links for the pages. And again, he has access to all pages for a single customer. So we can go to, say, page two. And if we activate, there's no buttons there. So if we activate 456 for customer 456, then the buttons are there for 456. If um, this user tries to activate, say, 123, no buttons because he doesn't have the privilege to activate that role on behalf of that customer. So that example that I just showed you is called the Apache Fortress ABAC demo, which corresponds with the first one. Same sort of policy, but just using, you know, fixing the role explosion problem with ABAC. So what are the next steps? So um, I showed you how to do dynamic constraints, doing user role activations, but what about role to permission? Is um, what you can introduce attribute modifiers into that phase as well. So we're thinking about that. We're also thinking about dynamic policies rather than just a simple matching algorithm. You could have any number of kinds of policies that are introduced. So this is how Fortress does user role activation constraints right now. I mentioned earlier that there's been temporal constraints since the very beginning. And it's just part, you know, in the configuration, you can just add them as many as you want. So we just added another one for the user role constraint. And it was just, I mean, it was so easy. And then we could do a similar thing for role to permission. And then you could do all, you know, just whatever. Any kind of policy you can imagine can be introduced. So closing thoughts, um, standard-based RBAC does not preclude the use of attributes. Nothing has ever stopped it. The, uh, the original specification has always allowed it and indeed encouraged it. And there are specifications that surround RBAC, specifically Insights 494, that prescribes it. That's the project, Apache Fortress. If you want to try it out, uh, come join us. Those are the examples that we just looked at. You're free to check them out. There's my contact info. And I don't, do we have time, Nadia, for? Okay, any questions? Uh, some attribute-based access control vendors, they claim that they have something like, um, for example, like, Intervals, something like an insurance granting access uh, to an employee um, working on a case which is only a certain amount of money, worth a certain mm -hmm. amount of money. Mm -hmm. huh. Okay, um, the question is um, do you have any ideas to implement things like um, a user has access to? For example, an insurance case, when the insurance case is below a certain limit or something. Good question. Yeah, and uh, so the answer is yes, you could introduce limits. Um, so back to this slide here, right? So on the roll to permission phase, you could say that permission, you can only do that action if the, the value of the transaction falls between or some certain values. Okay. You could absolutely do that. Not, it doesn't do it today, but yeah, that's, it could be done. Any other questions? Okay, it's, oh, Peter. It's a question more for Matt than for you. Uh, the um, Arabic overlay What's the status, and will that also have uh, attribute space yeah. enhancements? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So we were here in 2015 talking about the um, the uh, we call it the RBAC accelerator, which is the Open LDAP um, overlay that is a uh, policy decision point that's built inside of the directory. So that means you don't have to have something like a Fortress. Any LDAP v3 client can create sessions and, and interrogate permissions just as we, we saw, which I think. Um, 
So this, and so what's the status of it is, it's still in our cellar. Um, we're trying to figure out what to do with it, um, but it's. Uh, I, I think we need to release it. And um, but yeah, right now it's still sitting there. It's uh, still, you know, the code that is being tested. We just haven't released it. So. Any other questions? Okay, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much.